Hello. I know I just need to share it. Please don't get offended if I mute you. Yeah. Just don't mute me or I'll just, my mouth will be moving and, you know. Take it away, Christy. So my name's Christy Kutka. Oops, somebody just muted her. Actually, Christy, unmute yourself. Oh, that's good. See, that's, do it. here we are mm -hmm, already muting me. I wonder why. Um, so uh, my name's Christy Kutka. I've been with Chicago Title for 32 years. And yes, I do and have seen dead people, plenty of them because of what we do for a living here. Um, so we're going to we're going to kind of unpack a, a lot of like situations. Uh, a lot of people that are in this class have been privy to some of these situations that we have been involved in. Um, so so they're not going to be overly surprised because I'll probably, you know, it's probably going to be, you know, stories that we've had together. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say that a lot of these things can be solved by opening up a pre-order, okay, by, by opening up an, a preliminary title report. Now, what I am finding is that just because they order up a prelim in advance when they take the listing, um, recently I have been made aware that nobody's reading the preliminary title report when they pre-order them. So with that being said, it gets a little dicey because they don't know what they don't know. So they went, they took the steps of ordering the preliminary title report only to realize that they didn't, they never read it. They never read it. And it can solve all kinds of problems. So what I, what I do is when I open up a preliminary title report, I send it out. And then I say, these are the items that we need to address. Well, we can solve all kinds of problems in advance if we actually read the preliminary title report. So, um, so what we want to do is when you're taking this listing, we want to make sure that the people that are in title, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to request a copy of the vesting deed is what we're going to do is when we're taking this listing and we want to make sure that the people who are in that are taking the listing with you are the people who are on title and if they are not this is where we stop drop and roll basically okay so you can get a vesting deed a number of different ways uh, you can call our customer service department you can also um you can go on to our app and they have the document is there also. So variety of different ways you can call your sales rep. You can call your escrow officer. Do, do, you know, look, get that deed though. To, so you know who you are dealing with and um, because you don't want to take the listing from somebody who doesn't have the right to be selling the property. You don't want to go through all of the work and for all, for no reason. Okay. Um, so first things first, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about what to expect when you are divorcing. Okay. Uh, there are four potential scenarios. We have the people who are separated legally, um, or just separated, not legally, and then legally separated. And then the divorce is fi filed, but not final. And the divorce is final. Okay. In my world, if you're separated, not legally, you're still, you're, you're still married. Okay. So with that being said, we treat parties like they're still married. So that's when a lot of times we, we, we get, it gets dicey. Okay. Because people are already not in a good space and now they're going to be forced to get along for the most part. And that's that legal separation also. Um, so when we, when we start going down this road of legal separations and everything else, we're going to need to address um, liens that um, may be present in the escrow. We use the date of separation as a guideline. 
With regard to deed execution, we're going to follow the um, this very specific rules, and that is um, people who are married, they have to, everybody needs to sign, okay? If the buyer is buying a piece of property and they're legally separated, the their spouse will need to draw or sign the interspousal transfer deed. Doesn't matter if they're getting along or not, the spouse will need to sign an interspousal transfer deed. Now there there are some there's some things that we can wiggle around on. Now when if it's a cash deal, we can close and they don't have to sign an interspousal, but inevitably they will have to sign an interspousal. They're going to have to. Ex um, it, just, uh, say that they are not a party to our transaction. The way that it comes up later on is through a refinance or a sale. So at some point, they're going to have to sign an interspousal transfer deed. Doesn't mean we have to hold up an escrow for it, but it's still out there. When it comes down to um, a sale with a sale with a loan, though, the lender will require an interspousal transfer deed. Legal separation, same thing. Basically, we're gonna we're gonna address the liens. Um, the buyer is gonna have to. We're still gonna need that interspousal, and we'll need to clarify the distribution and all that kind of good stuff. Okay. Divorce has been filed, but not finalized. Same rules, basically. Buyer should have access. You know, um, we're gonna work with the parties to determine the separation, and all that kind of good stuff, but. Same thing, interspousal deed for the buyer and the seller, we're still gonna have everybody sign, okay? We're gonna, and then, you know, distributions and all that kind of good stuff. So it gets a, it gets a little bit easier when the divorce is final, kind of. So things that I start talking about with our customers, how they're gonna be filing taxes, how we're gonna be distributing funds. I have one right now where, um, Basically, I'm taking care of the sale of the transaction where, where normally it's a seller signing, selling as a couple. They're going to be selling as individuals. So they each have their own tax forms. I treat them as two separate entities. Okay. And um, they're going to have to give me an instruction. We're going to, we're going to, they can give me a court order, but I still draw up an instruction that says what to do with the proceeds when we close escrow. If it's 50-50, if it's going to a trust account with an attorney, all that kind of good stuff. So, but I, I do take a written instruction from the parties, not just the divorce decree. No, comma. I'm okay. We got a we got a muter right there. So um Divorce is final. Okay, so we did all that. Okay, so next. When we start dealing with missing spouses and all that kind of good stuff, a lot of times people are like, oh, I never dealt with that. You know, I just assumed that the property was being put in my name. Now, we can call in um, underwriting to assist us in... Um, interspousal deeds or de deeds off of title and all that kind of good stuff. But we do have to have authorization from Jenna. We have, you want to flip one? Hang on. Sorry. So um, when we're missing somebody, if I don't have a divorce decree, it gets messy quick. Um, they're going to have to take it to court if people are missing and they never deeded off a of title. If they have a certified copy of the divorce decree, then sometimes we can get that as a transfer of doc, you know, property, that kind of stuff. But again, we're going to get underwriting involved to make sure that we have the proper documentation to make all this happen. So next. Okay, so that's all of our divorce part. Okay. Now we're going to get into the super fun dead people. You know, um, a lot of people are like, well, you know, I have a will and he's deceased and I was supposed to inherit this property. Unfortunately, you know, a will is just not uh, enough for us to go off of. The courts still have to get involved. So, you know, a little play on words where there's a will, there's a way, a better way. So intestate, okay, um, if someone dies without a will, 
and then test date. Well, the uh, will creates and names people. So it does help with the probate experience, but um, it, you know, it still has to happen. Uh, our little, our little, you know, red at the bottom here, it's important to know a probate is still required. Okay. Even if there's a will, we got to remember that. So a lot of people are like, it's okay. I can sell this. I have, you know, I was, I inherited this property. We have to have the right documentation. You can like, quite honestly, until I am provided that information to confirm the info, you know, that the person that you're taking the listing from, I don't, I want to get that documentation as soon as possible. We do not want to get into the part where we have the buyer in place and we don't have the right documentation. Things have not been completed. So as soon as you hear, you know, somebody's deceased, I, I let's get him, let's get this pre-opened, let's get the right, you know, documentation. Let me deal with all that kind of good stuff. Okay, so next. When is it a straightforward with no probate required? You know, I, it's funny when people call, they're like, I don't, I don't know who was entitled yet. Yes, literally yesterday I had a call from a customer and she was very concerned because she was taking, um, she was talking to one customer and she wasn't sure if they really ha had the interest in the property. I always breathe just a little bit easier when I see that they held title as joint tenants. Joint tenants means that if something happens to one of you, it goes to the survivor. So she was talking to one of the people who were in title already. So the good news about that, you know, is that it goes to the survivor. The next one is community property with right of survivorship. That says the same thing, okay? That if something happens to one of you, it goes to the survivor. The joint tenants can be held um, with me and Jen. We can own a piece of property together as joint tenants. Um, but if I were to hold title as community property with right of survivorship, it would have to be me and my spouse. Okay. Don't make jokes, people. I know I don't have a spouse, but if I had a spouse, okay, I know I can hear you giddy people on the sidelines. I don't want to hear it though. Anyway, next one, revocable transfer on death deed. Okay. So it's a document that has come out of the woodwork that basically says that if something happens to me, there is some doc, there's some time that has to go in between, it, but it would go to my, I could put, I, I own the property until I die. And then it would go to, I would put in there my children. So they would, in, they would inherit the property after my passing. And then there's some tax consequences and stuff like that. Now, with that being said, you need to talk to your tax professional to make sure what is the best way for not just you, but for the people that you're leaving this property to, you know, um, I don't have, I, I can't give that recommendation. I can't tell you how to hold title or anything like that. But what I will say is that, um, there are, is one other, the, the big mama of it all that basically says if something happens to anybody who's in title, there's this trust, we can put this trust in place. Right. And, um, the beneficiaries, it's theirs until they are passing and they can state who the property goes to if something happens to both of them. No probate for that either. Okay. But again, we go down this road. Um, I, I am the success, you know, I'm sitting down with you at, at a listing agreement, right? In a listing appointment, excuse me. And I say, I have the right to sell this property. Well, I need the documentation that shows that you have the right to sell this property. I just went through a big old rigmarole recently where they were acting funny and they did not want to provide me the documentation showing that they were the successor trustees because they didn't want to give me a copy of the trust. Well, I don't need the whole trust, but I need the documentation that shows that they are the successor trustees and he was, he was playing games with me. And I, I mean, at, at that point, if we do not get the documentation that we need, then unfortunately we have to resign as escrow holder. We can't, we have to have the documentation that they, to show that they are the successor trustees. We've had ones where, um, 
we had to get attorneys involved because we didn't have the proper documentation. So just remember this documentation thing, we don't want to get knee deep in this transaction and have a buyer on standby because you, you as the listing agent, if you've taken it from the wrong person, I, I just can't imagine that there's no liability, especially if there's like appraisals and things like that being ordered and you haven't taken a listing from the right person. So there's my two cents. Okay, let's talk about probate. So the purpose of a probate, it is to determine who has the rights to the property. It's going to determine who, um, not only who has the rights to the property, but it also is going to determine who can sign on behalf of the estate, all kinds of stuff. So um, when it Let's go through this list here. It says a will is proved to be valid. So they're going to be able to determine who is entitled to the property. Administration of personal and property assets and debts of an estate. And then it determines heirs, divisees. And I'm not even going to try that word. Legacies. I don't know. I don't use that word. That's, that's not even a word that I would even use. So whatever that is, I don't do that. Judicial determination of character and status of vesting. Okay. So um, we're going to deal with all kinds of vesting. And then final distribution, court order. Okay. Probate, a court procedure that directs distribution of assets of a decedent when there is a will or no will or trust. Okay. Here to, here to give you the bad news it takes about a year. So there's nothing worse. And I, let me tell you, I've seen it more than I'd like to like to say. Oh, they're entitled to this property, but they have never started the probate. Yeah, it's a problem. Go back to the drawing board. We, you know, get, I had um, last week, I had a gentleman who did his own probate because there, if they had hired an attorney, the it was going to take forever surprisingly he had all the documentation that i needed in order to be able to close the transaction but i, I think that in my many years of escrow i haven't seen that many people who have handled their own probate as an individual without an attorney involved so the fact that he did it i'm like bravo sir you know he was a little frustrated at the end because I was listing off documentation because the documentation is still the documentation, whether there's an attorney involved or not. I still need tax ID numbers. He had no idea that he needed one of those all dialed in. He still, we still needed to have a uh, uh, bank account in the name of the estate because we needed to have the money because we make the check payable to the, uh, you know, whoever's entitled. So let's go down this whole road. So it's going to take a year. Property can be transferred during that probate, but we have to have court approval. And then um, once the probate's ended, property can be sold using the court order documentation. So letters and all that kind of good stuff. Okay. No such thing as a fast escrow when there's a probate. There, I mean, everything has to be done and I have to have all the documentation. You know, and the, when it's closed, that's one thing, but, another, you know, the, the reality is, is that there's letters, there's information that needs to be sent out to all the beneficiaries that says that the property is being sold. So that's what I know about that. Okay. The probate process. We have, and I love that it's all, um, it's all blurry here because I, this is where I'm glad my glasses are on because um, mm -hmm, it's a, it's one of those. So we, you know, so we have our little roadmap here through probate. We have that they're going to file the petition with the courts. Then they have to publish notices. Then they have their hearing date on the probate petition. Then they have to prepare final accounting, give notices to the creditors prepare and file inventory, send notices of the final accounting, and then the court sets a hearing and the final accounting. And then they distribute the assets pursuant to the court order. And then there's the final discharge. Now, I know I was able to read that off real fast. 
but those are not fast processes at all. Yeah, we we got to understand that 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 everything takes time. Okay, so um, and these are the time frames right here, right? We have four to six weeks, four months minimum, up to a year, eighteen months, four to six weeks. I mean, probate takes a minute. Okay, and when I say a minute, I don't mean a minute. I mean like a longer than a minute. But you know, so just realize. It, it takes a bit. So make sure, again, you don't have a buyer in place that you have all your, your ducks in a row, okay? And Christy, I'm just gonna jump in for a second because where it says hearing date on petition for probate, letters issued, you will ask for the letters of administration on a transaction with probate. So we need more than just the death certificate. Oh yeah. These types of transactions. A matter of fact, I mean like, yeah, I confirm that somebody's deceased, but I don't need a certified copy of the death certificate. When, I, when I'm when dealing with um, people who are deceased, I do, I have to take the certified copy of the letters testamentary or, or administration. I have to have that original document from the courts in order to build sell the, tar the property. Okay. Manny Camarena has asked, does transferred mean sold during probate? Does transferred mean sold? Yes. And where are we looking at that? I'm wondering where are we looking at that? <laughs> Manny, if you wanted to unmute for a moment and ask your question, you can. Transferred does mean sold. But I'm looking, I'm trying to figure out on the previous screen. Okay. Let's go back. It said property can be, oh, transferred. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Property can be transferred. Yes. During probate. Now, and again, we have to have authorization from the courts to do that though. So I have been in a place where um, we're ready to, everybody's ready to close, but the courts have not given us the authorization to be able to fulfill that transaction, okay? There's specific dates when there, it comes down to disclosing and all that kind of good stuff, okay? Who gets the money in a probate sale? So the check gets made payable to the estate. I do not distribute funds. I do not distribute it to the executor or the administrator, even if they are the only beneficiary of this property. The check gets made payable to the estate. There has to be a bank account in the name of the estate. Okay. Um, if the estate has cleared probate, the funds will be distributed to the, okay. And now if it's been the, the, it changes when the property has already been deeded into the people's names. Okay. So they've already done the probate process and they distributed the probate has already distributed the property to the beneficiaries. So now I have me and someone else as the actual owners, then I will make the checks payable to those people. Okay, does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Okay, so next. Trust simple, simply the process. The trust spells out exactly what happens upon the death of the trustee. So that's why I need copies of the trust so I can fulfill what the requirements were of the original owners of that trust. When a property is in a trust, the original trustee or, or, or a successor must be our seller. So um, the trust is the actual seller and the people that are signing on behalf of the trust are uh, our signers, okay? It's, kind of, I always describe it as the entity that is selling this property is the trust. Okay. I, uh, I'll say, okay, so I am assistant vice president for Chicago title. Now, just because I'm the assistant vice president of Chicago title doesn't mean that I can 
that it, I am the seller. Chicago title is the seller. And it's the same thing with this entity here, right? So the trustee is not the seller. The trustee is signing on behalf of the trust, okay? Or the successor trustee. So with, that's, who our, that's who our seller is. So when people say, who do I put as my seller? It's the entity. And then there are people who are signing on behalf of that entity. Uh, if the person is deceased, we'll need a copy of the trust to confirm the correct parties are selling the property. I sound like a broken record now, huh? Then we say we're, we're going to prepare a trust certification. Okay, a trust certification says who is entitled to sell this property on behalf of the trust. Okay, so, and they're going to sign it under penalty of perjury. So that means we're going to come after and get them if they're lying to us. That's what that means. So don't lie. Don't lie. Next, who gets the money if it's in a trust? I think you guys all know this answer because I am like a broken record with this. So if the property is being sold in a trust and I have to make the check payable to whoever is in title, that means that I am making the check payable to the trust. There has to be a bank account in the name of the trust. I try to tell people as early as possible in our transaction that they need to have a bank account in the name of their trust, okay? Now, if there is a seller who, excuse me, a buyer who's buying in their trust, they also need a bank account because if there's any refund of funds, they, it's going to be made payable to the trust also. Okay. I'm just, I, I don't have a way around it. I have to be dealing with the people or the entities that I'm dealing with. Okay. Um, and Christy, how often would you say that you get a phone call after closing from people saying, I can't cash this check. I need it made payable to me. Well, I'd be a very rich woman if I got a dollar for every time I've heard that because I tell people, but here's, here's the big deal about being an escrow. It is such a, an emotional period that for some reason, people can see and hear me talking, but they don't hear or see me talking. It's the weirdest, weirdest thing. So I can tell people a million times, go open up a trust account, go open up a trust account. And they go, okay. They don't go and open up a trust account. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost comical and it's really comical when you've told them a million times and then they come out, you come at you fired up because they can't open up a trust account. Now, I told you before we closed escrow that you needed to open up a trust account. I have it in writing and that, and I will still help people gaslight me into thinking that I have not told them. So. But if, as the realtor representing these people, you could also tell them maybe. They well, them maybe they the hear. Point. Yeah, maybe they hear your voice better than they hear my screechy one. I don't know. It could happen. So, and I'm really, if you think about it, you guys have a better relationship with the customer than I do. They're going to, you know, you've built a full on relationship with these buyers and sellers. They, you need to say, this is one of the things you got to get done. And how, it's, it's a very simple process. They bring in the trust paperwork with them. If the, if people are deceased, they have to bring in the tax ID number with them for the estate or for the trust, excuse me, and it gets opened. It really isn't, it's just time consuming. A lot of banks, they require um, uh, appointments to get these accounts open, but it really isn't that big of a deal. When I opened up my, cause I have a trust, when I opened up mine, they were able to blanket in my personal account with my trust account. So literally they took the paperwork and made it one. So I, I don't have multiple accounts. I just have one, but the beneficiary of my account is my trust. So it's super easy. It's just time consuming. What makes things more complicated? I personally like it where people don't tell me that people are deceased. That's really fun. And I, and there's an assumption when I send out the preliminary title report again, that 
you know, we're all on the same page, but a lot of times people just are like, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you they're, they're deceased. Well, there's things that I have to do on my end, i.e. collecting documentation, make sure that we're just like we've already talked about, right? I got to get all the, the proper documentation in place. Um, if an affidavit of death hasn't been reported, I have to draw that document. I need to, sometimes I need to get um, certified copies of death certificates. You know, I am, I am still a firm believer that escrow should be relatively fun. Maybe like, I don't know if we should say fun. Okay. It shouldn't be a completely stressful situation. And I don't think that it has to be. I really, I really don't, especially if on day one of a transaction, I'm able to go and say, especially when the noise is the noise in people's heads are not as loud on day one as they are on day 15 or day 20, day 30 they're They can't hear a dang thing. I say nothing. They can't hear anything. So with that being said, it's super important for me to be able to have those conversations long before they're starting to pack boxes because people can't hear a thing that's going on. So, and, and when they've packed, they've packed those certified copies of those death certificates, which I love nothing more because I'm like, you know, and, and they don't know where that box is. And now we're going to have to go to the, get that certified copy of the death certificate, which we can pray and hope that they died in Fresno County. But if they haven't, it, it gets messy quick. So um, things that also make it difficult when we're, we're missing people, we don't know where they are. Okay. Beneficiaries. Mm -hmm, that's a problem. Cause we have to make, again, they're the ones who are selling the property. Um, I have one right now. It's a probate. And I had to call the customer because there are liens against the property. Old liens. There is an $11,500 deed of trust from 1991. Now, I can assume that that deed of trust has been paid in full. But the bottom line is, is that I, I can't assume anything in this job. My job is to clear title and give the buyer free and clear title. Right. So they, they, they can't, they're not going to have any means to follow up with later on. So two days ago, I called my customer and I said, Hey, there's this due to trust on here. And I don't know if American general is still around. So I have people on my end that are searching for the new because the company has since gone out of business, but they've transferred to different companies, right? So they, the customer was able to find whoever inherited American General's bank of, book of business, excuse me. And so we're all moving in the right direction to find somebody who can do a document called a reconveyance stating that it's been paid in full. So we're, we're but there's nothing worse than having these documents that we don't know who can sign on behalf of the lender. If we can't find the, the person who hold held that deed of trust, then we have to go and we have to get this lost document bond and it's kind of a pain and it's an additional 30 days. So again, if you look at the preliminary title report and find out that there is an, there is a, a lien against the property, we can solve these problems in advance, you know, and I'll, I'm just finding, I, I, if I, I think that within the last couple months, I have like five prelims that I've done in advance and nobody's reading them. I will go through them with you. I will be, I will volunteer as tribute to go through these documents with you. As long as we don't have problems when we get a buyer, I am, I am volunteering. I am begging you because it's too stressful at the end to be dealing with this stuff. Okay. There's my crying. Okay. I'm done. I'm done crying. And, and again, I hate you all for not being on camera and not snickering with me. I think you guys stink. So Next, because I'm sitting here humored by myself, and that's just wrong. And then death during escrow. That's not a problem if the customer has signed. I, again, I have one right now that's closing actually today. The, the sweet little gentleman died 
a week ago. His funeral is today and the escrow is closing today. It's all, it's all happening still. Geo, no, it doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm not paying attention to you, Geo. So next, uh, if a buyer dies though, we'll usually cancel the escrow, okay? Because they can't really buy a piece of property when they're, they're deceased, okay? If the surviving party wants to do it, I mean, it gets dicey. I would get underwriting involved to make sure that we, you know, we're doing what's right for the estate, but that's, that's kind of where we go with that. Okay, that's it. That's all I got. I so Christine, one thing that, you know, we have to put in a lot of practices to make sure that we're dealing with the right people. Uh, what have been any situations where somebody with bad intent might be trying to take advantage of this opportunity? Funny story. I was talking to one of our investors and he was buying the property from an attorney who had completed a probate and he, the, the attorney had just enough information to do this probate, right? And come to find out he never had, he was not doing it with, with a, a kind heart. He was doing it with an evil heart. So um, when we deal, when we deal with those bad guys, you know, our job as an escrow holder, the reason why you have title insurance is because you're insuring against fraud, right? And everyone's like, oh, we don't need a title policy. Okay, you don't need a title policy until you really need a title policy. So there was that, there was that probate situation. I had within the last six months, I had the transaction cash deal. Buyer is a as a, a real estate agent, he has found this property that he's going to purchase and he's going to flip the little old lady. I've been dealing with her caregiver and my spidey senses are going off. Something is not right. I am just like, mm -mm, mm -mm, something's not right. And I'm thinking that it is elder abuse is what I'm thinking. The money from my transaction is going to fidelity for a mobile home. And I call our notary and I say, hey, I need you to go see the seller. Um, she is elderly. She can't get out of bed. So can you go and notarize her? So I'm like, but I need you to know my spidey senses are going crazy. And originally the, the caregiver is trying to give me information on um, uh, where to disperse funds and everything. And I'm like, nope, I'm going to make the check payable to the little lady. They have to come pick it up and the story. I'm not wiring it anywhere. None of that stuff. Especially since I have to take all written instruction from our little old lady. So my notary goes out and notarizes the lady. She is uh, oxygen mask in bed, all the things. It's a problem. And we we call it, she, the notary comes back. She says, it, it was the most disgusting house I've ever been in, blah, 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 blah. But you know, the little lady with who the little lady, she, her license had expired. So they had to have two people come in and, um, vouch that they were, that she was who she said she was. She had the expired license, but that wasn't enough. So we got the little people coming, come to find out. Okay. This is after I've closed escrow. I've distributed, I've given the money to, Fidelity, they've closed their transaction. I get a call from the white collar crime people. Evidently, the little old lady tried to go get money out, come to find out that it was not our little old lady. The EECU was able to find out that this was a bad, this was a wrong person. They, and the reason they did it was because of the thumbprint, right? That's how they find out, found her. Come to find out our little old lady, our seller is in a convalescent hospital. She is not selling this property. The, the, um, caregiver was up to no good. She got another old lady to impersonate the first old lady. It was just a bad gig. Title insurance has stepped in, right? Now the buyer of our property, it gets completely undone. 
The commissions have to come back in. Everything needs to be undone again. The money for the sales price goes to back to the buyer. He gets, but he doesn't get, he, that's what his a title insurance policy is for, right? He's going to get the price of the owner's policy has been paid for by the seller. He's going to get the price of his, the sales price back to him. And then everything, everything gets undone. Now you don't want to be that agent, right? You don't want to be that agent that has got in the middle of everything and you have to give back your commissions because you will. So Christy, yeah. we got a question. Can a prelim be requested prior to the listing agreement or only once we have a listing agreement? Uh, our preference is listing agreement. Yes. Um, but we can find out a lot through just customer service. Mm -hmm. If you have some questions, our amazing Gail or your sales exec or your escrow officer can take a peek at the chain and, and see what's up and get you deed copies and, and answer a lot of those questions. So yeah, it's it's super it it's super easy to get the right paperwork for you. Um, the reason we want everybody on the hook because when we do these preliminary title reports, we're not going to pass on the price to our buyer and seller if it cancels. We're not going to do that, but there is a cost to our company to do these preliminary title reports. So we want to make sure that if we're doing this for you, that you are going to step in and fight for us. Like we're going to get this deal at some point. So any other questions, questions, questions? I could go on with stories forever, but I'm not allowed to do that. <laughs> yeah. At this point, if people want to unmute and ask their questions, we've got a little bit of time. If you're ready to jump off, just want to say, Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at our next class. As I mentioned, we'll have this recording sent out later today, and if you think of anything down the road that you're curious about, don't hesitate to reach out to me, to your sales exec, or to your escrow officer, or just call up Christy. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll open it up for questions and stop sharing my screen. Okay. They don't, they don't need me. They're done. They're, they don't want to hear my voice anymore. I don't blame them. <laughs> I don't blame them. All right. Well, you must have just done such a fantastic job of explaining what we need and what we go through that there are no more questions. Joanne's applauding, I can see. So um, I guess I pay her a lot of money to do that. <laughs> so with that we will conclude today's session and again thank you for joining us 